What a last couple of years it's been around our global pandemic, and I want to thank all of you who are public servants as well as we have a number of elected officials, um, and want to take this opportunity. So, bonjour à tous. Ça fait plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. I see a good Maple Leaf fan here. Of course, I'm a good Montreal boy originally. Uh, immigrated to Ontario, and here I am, but, um, and he's got the Matthews jersey going too, right? So um, I want to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so, some thoughts, some musings, some ideas, uh, take some questions, but, you know, I want to start off with recognizing that good roads lead to great communities. And when we have road safety, and we have a planning and an infrastructure in a community that is livable, that is walkable, that allows our roadways to be shared. Good things actually happen in our communities. And it's been an interesting process. Uh, many of you who are elected officials, you know, I'm quite certain that anecdotally, many of your emails that come into your inbox are related to road safety, to speeding, to why we need a stop sign. Can we add some electronic enforcement? We need more policing. I haven't seen a cop in weeks maybe months. And so it's a really interesting process as we roll through, as we learn to live with COVID. You'll recognize that over the last couple of years, road safety has been a significantly challenging approach in Ontario, where we've seen you know, a, a, such an increase in stunt driving, aggressive driving, impaired driving in Ontario. We also are dealing with many different policing issues many different challenges that are taking police leaders in many different challenging ways. And in many ways, police leaders at an intersection wondering, which way do we go? The economics of policing, the evolution of policing, the equity within policing, race-based data collection, building the recruitment of our police forces. These are significant challenges, use of force and some of the different pieces. And so I think we're all learning to live with COVID. We all know that we still have some challenging times ahead, but I wanna talk a little bit about a road safety perspective and share a couple of different you know, uh, data and collision data with you and talk about why this is important from a police leadership perspective, particularly as we head into May, which is Canada Road Safety Week, and which will be from May 17th to May 23rd. But if you look at the latest data, 2020, we're always generally behind in data. And of course, we have some anomalies with the pandemic and you know, our infrastructure. Um, you know, I came from Waterloo Region, sort of Cambridge today, which is about 100 kilometers uh, you know, southwest of here to, to the Royal York. And I was trying to gauge the time and, and the traffic. It was relatively smooth. But you know, on my way here, the amount of different challenges I see you know, driving here, and we all drive on a regular basis, or we take transit or other processes. In 2020, just over 1,745 fatalities. These are people, these are citizens of our community. They're people that we may know in the urban and rural piece. The challenges and the circle of impact of trauma is pretty significant. A slight decrease from 2019 about 7,868 serious collisions with serious injuries, which may require extrication in different processes, and more than 101,572 collisions with injuries. And that's down significantly from 2019. Some good news, some good stuff, some anomalies. But the reality is, is that many of us, of course, are, at the same time, we're also dealing with the opiate crisis in many of our communities, record-breaking citizens that are dying from addiction, from concurrent disorders, and all of us are trying to balance and juggle public monies. Where do we spend? How do we manage housing? How do we manage affordable housing? And how do we manage critical infrastructure? And why I talk about this is I think I want to challenge us here as community leaders, as governors, that I firmly believe that we have a lot of money in the system, but it's how we allocate the money in the system. You know, when I pull together a policing budget, I always share with our leadership team, because I do have some leaders saying, chief, ask for more people, go to council, go to the board. And I go, we have to be balanced. We have to take an appropriate approach. 
And for me, municipal budgeting is like, you know, baking a pie. You have to have all the right ingredients. If you have too much of policing, transit suffers, the library may suffer, recreation and leisure may suffer, roads may suffer. If you have too much of, you know, my dear friends, the fire service, little humor there. Um, <laughs> tough crowd. Uh, I'm back next week at four o'clock. Uh, no. But the reality is, is that I do believe that there's money in the system. And I'm going to take you through this collision data because this is pretty significant. The community impact, it goes beyond just the data. So when we're making decisions, the circle of impact, the community trauma, depending on where you live, the news release may just be a name. But think about the horrific collision most recently on the 401. New Canadians, students visiting our country killed on the 401 in a horrific collision. Global impact, province-wide impact. But then let's go to, you know, rural Waterloo region, St. Jacobs. Somebody is injured or deceased in a collision. The community trauma is significant. It impacts the neighborhood. It impacts potentially a school, it impacts a workplace. And family and victim impact, lives are forever changed. And what I believe, and what the Canadian Chiefs believe are, for the majority of all of those collisions, preventable because of human behavior. Yes, there may be engineering, road design, and some different pieces from time to time, and environment and climate, and all those processes. But there's massive community impact as we roll through this. Of course, you know, this is a scene in Waterloo. You can see all the different agencies that even a simple collision brings together. There's systems impact. Public works. Maybe we need barricades. Maybe we need a salter. Maybe we need a hazmat team to come out. There's significant challenges. And of course, this just doesn't happen Monday to Friday, 8 to 4. It happens 24-7, 365. Road design. In a fatality, the coroner will be involved. There'll be a coroner's report. There may be a requirement for the municipality to look at road design, look at snow fencing, look at different barriers. Of course, that leads to monetary impact. Speed studies. Collision may be as a result of speed. And the police service requests speed studies, which requires traffic technologists, requires engineering. All of these things pull from our system. Signage may be requiring signage. I live in a region that has 78 roundabouts. In the Highway Traffic Act, in 2022, you will not find any legislation around roundabouts in our Ontario Highway Traffic Act. In our MTO training centers, the G1 doesn't have to go through a roundabout to pass their driver exam. I love roundabouts. They're environmentally friendly. They reduce the severity of collisions. They keep traffic moving. But there's a lot of minor collisions in roundabouts, which impact policing, which tie up traffic congestion, and are they really hard for pedestrians to get through a roundabout. And so again, I'm very supportive, I love roundabouts, but the reality is, is that there's issues around these whole piece of signage and how we do this, and of course litigation. Uh, those of you that, you know, municipalities get litigated, police services get litigated, it costs money, there's impact on emergency services. Fire, police, paramedics, tiered response, impact on our healthcare system, in an emergency room that is already overburdened with other challenges, can we reduce that by good roads? And of course our judicial system, if there's an offense, we lay a charge, and then of course the impact on the insurance system, right? All roads lead to ultimately the driver. So here's a little bit of the economic impact on systems. In 2020, the average collision in Canada, so just a property damage collision, maybe police, a tow truck, maybe fire comes, Maybe Public Works comes to clean up some broken glass. 
Then, you know, there's an adjuster. There's all these different pieces. The average cost is $78,900. It's amazing. You know, you factor in the communicator, the 911 operator. You know, maybe you live in a community like myself where small collisions go to a reporting center. So you factor in the heat, the hydro, the staffing to manage that. It's still cost effective. You look at the average fatality, though, $1.41 million. And you'll remember I said there was just over 1,745 fatalities, $2.46 billion a year across our nation from road fatalities. Where could our municipalities allocate that money? I'm sure all of us are looking at our budgets and looking at ways to reallocate, to do business differently. Again, I believe there's money in the system through policy, through divergent thinking and divergent approaches. Of course, the fatal four. Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police has been encouraging the 194 police leaders across the country is let's focus on the fatal four. Evidence shows us that speeding, aggressive driving, distracted driving, restraint, seatbelt use, and impaired driving, whether by alcohol or drug, is the leading cause of collisions in Canada. So let's not worry about, you know, the headlight out. You know, maybe you want to deal with that. Let's not worry about, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, well, the Val tag, that, that's sort of a thing of the past. Uh, shortly, but it's been a thing of the past the last two years. Let's focus on key issues. Let's actually allocate police resources so we can show true reduction in the issues. Um, Mad Canada did a study in 2010. From 1999 to 2010, the impact of impaired driving in Canada was $20.6 billion. That's the latest study that Mad Canada has done. They haven't done one since, but you can think in 2022 what that looks like. Just a reminder, Canada Road Safety Week's coming to your community. And so the reason why I raise this particular issue, and I'm going to you know, sort of talk about some different pieces, is that I do believe we can make a difference from a policy perspective, by the way we engineer, by the way we do work. That includes electronic enforcement. And I know it's challenging, right? Because when I say electronic enforcement, we think of photo radar, which probably takes us back to the 1990s you know, sort of that common sense revolution, all that other stuff. But if you looked at the photo radar data on Highway 401, insurmountable in the sense of it reduced collisions, it reduced uh, fatalities on the 401. It upset a lot of people. And now we're seeing electronic enforcement come back into our communities and community safety zones and school zones. How could, you know, electronic enforcement in a school zone upset any citizen when our most precious cargo, our future, our kids, are in that school zone. And guess who's getting those tickets? The people that live in that neighborhood. That's who's getting the tickets. And so, from an electronic enforcement perspective, I encourage all of us, let's work beyond some of the, you know, pushback and all these different things. Red light cameras have reduced significantly T-bone collisions in large urban areas. Yeah, at the first little while, there's a ton of rear ends because everybody's jamming on their brakes and those types of things, but red light cameras have been successful. Speed limits, I live in a, a multi-tiered community, seven municipalities and of course the region. So we have regional roads, we have municipal roads. So we have eight municipalities. Guess how many speed limits we have in the region? eight different sets, which is driver confusion. As a police service, we're trying to get all everybody, all the governors together to say, if you want to go to 30 or 40, we support that in, you know, neighborhoods. The evidence shows that, you know, pedestrian collisions and all those different bicycle collisions, the, the chance of, you know, survival is much greater. Still going to hurt, but, you know, this is a good thing. But let's build a common sense so that this, the driver knows wherever they go, they're there. Road design is a massive, you know, clearly those, you know, the planners in the room, um, I feel for you. You're trying to accommodate e-scooters, skateboards, rollers, you know, e-bicycles, bicycles. It's a challenging, we're changing our roadways. 
We're changing our roadways significantly, and I do you know, certainly feel for all of you, but we have to ch change the way we share our roads. Our communities are changing. MTO licensing and automotive manufacturing. Automated vehicles. You know, I, I'm driving a vehicle that if I s come out of the lane a little bit, the steering wheel vibrates and pushes me back in. It tells me when I should stop for a break. All of these things we can lobby to help reduce and build good roads in our community. The philosophy of the Canadian Chiefs is let's engage our citizens, let's explain our citizens, let's educate them, and the last piece we want to look at is enforcement. You know, police leaders don't view enforcement as revenue generation, right? Every once in a while, this, you know, my city administrative officer will call me and say, you know, the provincial events is court, so, you know, they're kind of, you know, they're in deficit, um, you know, enforcement's down, what's going on? Well, we get these pressures, we get these pressures, you know, our traffic teams had all these collisions, you know, we haven't been out. But the reality is, is the four E's, engage, explain, educate. We want compliance. It's like bylaw. You know, we actually want compliance. Enforcement should be a last resort for the most outrageous drivers as we, as we deal with this. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit into policing 2022 and beyond. Um, it'd be an understatement to say that policing has not been in the spotlight in the last couple of years. From coast to coast, in Ontario, including Ontario, policing and police reform and transformation and evolution has been in the spotlight. And we should be thankful for that. We should always be evolving. We should always be changing. Our recruitment should be reflective of the Ontario that we're serving. Our province is changing significantly. We should be having a province-wide discussion on race-based data collection, around use of force, around who's within our criminal justice system, because that will allow our governors and our cities and police leaders to plan our communities differently for safer communities. And so we shouldn't shy away from this discussion. That being said, I do want to take a moment to recognize that in Canadian policing across the globe, we're often looked to as an incredible system of democracy, where police services have independence, from government influence, have independence from making decisions. You would have seen a lot of that most recently in occupation and the occupation in Ottawa and Coots, Alberta, where many politicians were on TV saying, we don't tell police what to do, but we have to work in collaboration. We have to work together. Police leaders should be meeting with elected officials to discuss modern day policing. They should be meeting with the city administration and the city leadership team to talk about how do we work together? How do we share resources? How do we share systems for the better economic impact of the communities we serve? But I do believe, and this is a photo of, this is a little bit of implicit bias because all of these officers are from Waterloo. I do believe that the future's bright. The recruit that we're bringing into policing in Ontario is significantly trained in Academics is getting excellent training at the Ontario Police College. The Solicitor General's office is working on new regulations and adequacy standards around policing. And I do believe slowly, it's always never fast enough, we're seeing culture change. We're seeing evolution. We're dealing with some long-standing issues in policing, which are challenging. They're hard conversations. They're hard conversations when you're talking about systemic bias, systemic racism systemic discrimination, institutional bias. These are hard conversations for us to have, but they're important conversations because they will lead to a better tomorrow.